Thank you, Paul. And from uh, IFC, our collective thanks to the Mining and Daba team for uh, putting on a, a great event. The heart of the message in uh, this talk for the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes is political risk. How we see political risk evolving for the mining sector here in Africa and strategies from our viewpoint to mitigate those risks. But of course before the risks come the opportunities. And we too at IFC, like many of the uh, speakers before us, see opportunities growing in Africa. Whether you prefer to get this in the form of uh, Economist or other magazine covers, or whether you prefer to get it in statistics, the core message about the continent is inescapable Africa is rising. Economic growth today is well, abo well above the world average. The run of economic growth the last several years is clearly unprecedented, and it's been resilient in the face of difficulties in the overall global environment. Underpinning that growth has been increased political stability, and while we have seen several setbacks in recent months, we've also seen a number of positive transitions, whether they be Guinea, Ivory Coast, or Senegal, underpinning the general positive direction in terms of overall uh, political stability. And with political stability has come improved economic governance. Again, not perfect in many places, but clear improvements in terms of the policy choices made in a great number of the countries in the region, and broad-based progress, in particular in terms of investment climate reform. In the annual World Bank ranking of difficulties in doing business uh, across the world, the Doing Business Report, in 2013-50 of the top performing countries in the world, of the top 50 top performing countries in the world, 17 were here in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we also believe economic growth today will be economic growth tomorrow. Over the next five years, Africa is projected to grow on average at 5.5% a year, well over the projections for the world average, well over the projections for all other regions other than emerging Asia, and more than double the projected growth of uh, the advanced economies. And that future growth will also be underpinned by a social transformation here in Africa, with the population growing and increased urbanization. Africa as we have heard from many sources, is about to see a demographic dividend, with the population growing faster than any other region. In particular, that population growth will start to be seen in working age population, rather than the pattern we see in a number of other regions with increases, in particular in the non-working age, older parts of the population. The McKinsey report recently on jobs uh, and the labor force in Africa was a very clear uh, marker of where that is going with the sign that in a couple of decades the labor force here in Africa will be larger than the labor force in China or the labor force in India. And with urbanization, today 41 percent of Africans live in cities, a percentage that is growing by one percent every two years. And by 2033, we project that Africa, like the rest of the world, will be a majority urban continent. And urbanization and development go together with a large urban consumer base. Firms and consumers benefit from scale economies. And at the IFC, we see the impact of Africa rising in our investments. From less than 10 percent of IFC's global investment portfolio only five years ago, today Sub-Saharan Africa is the second largest region of investment for us. And we project that in three years, we will be investing more in Sub-Saharan Africa than in any other region of the world. Mining has been a key part of Africa's economic growth and will continue to be so in the future. Mineral revenues account on average for 5% of GDP in the mineral-rich countries in Africa. And as you can see from the chart on the slide, it's critical for government expenditures in many countries. And also for us at IIC, Africa already accounts 
for more than one half of all our global mining investments. With close to one third of total global resources, Africa is ripe for much more mining investment, in principle great news for investors and government treasuries alike. This greater potential is, of course, everyone's main topic of conversation outside this hall. And here we can see some important elements of that potential. Relative underinvestments in this region compared to other regions, deterioration of quality and rising costs experienced in extraction of resources in other parts of the world, growing exploration investments here in Africa, projected by the World Bank to be doubling decade to decade, and exploration increasingly present in fragile and conflict-affected states of the region. So the opportunity comes first, but political risk is very much there, and in our view, is likely to be rising. What have we seen? We've seen violent labor disputes in several countries, most recently here in South Africa, in Madagascar, several other places. We've seen uncertainties over licenses or over taxation. We've seen talks of resource nationalism. We've seen difficulties in access to infrastructure or maintenance of infrastructure vital to getting resources to market. And these issues are driven by several underlying factors, including, as no weak governance, issues on employment, issues in terms of appropriateness uh, and availability of skills, and increasingly also issues related to the infrastructure deficits of Africa. IFC, of course, has no magic wand to make political risk disappear. We don't believe anyone has that wand. But what makes us different, with our being both a commercial partner and an institution owned by many, many governments, is decades of watching the interface between companies, businesses, and governments. And from that experience, our main lesson is the alignment, very close alignment, between political risk and economic development. The latter, we believe, is the best mitigation for the former. Jobs and skills are one aspect of economic development and one tool for reducing risks that many of you in the room are familiar with and use actively. But familiarity should not be confused with declining relevance. When we at IFC meet with our shareholding governments, this is a theme we hear more and more. Demographics are bringing more Africans into the workforce every year. And economic reforms are raising expectations about job creations to come in the wake of those reforms. As a visible but not highly labor-intensive industry, mining can expect those forces to lead governments to bring their employment creation issues to their doorstep. And in this vein, we very much welcome the new initiative championed by the UN, the Economic uh, Commission for Africa, and Anglo Gold Ashanti, the African Mineral Skills Initiative, which we think is an important multi-stakeholder contribution that will help both young Africans, their country's economies, as well as the mining industry. Local procurement is an important aspect of this employment challenge. Some numbers we've come across from around the world show the benefits to economies of local procurement can be very significant. In Chile, BHP's Spence mine generated spend in the domestic economy of, when we surveyed it, when it was surveyed, over $460 million annually. Escondida was procuring $228 million a year in the late 1990s. Barrick Gold's regional purchases of goods and services at Zaldivar was studied as being uh, at over $375 million in 2010. Studies show these income multipliers can vary from two to five of the actual investments in mining projects where local linkages are strong and indirect job creation can be significant. And building these and making local governments aware of these can be highly useful. Indeed, studies of IFC mining clients 
have even shown in some instances job multipliers as high as 28. Multi-stakeholder approaches are also emerging with the objective to build up local supply chains that can service the larger industry, local procurement becoming more systemic and sustainable in the long run. In Ghana, IFC has partnered with the Chamber of Mines, the Ghana Minerals Commission in Newmont to implement a more holistic approach to local sourcing. And IFC generally works with companies to develop local procurement strategies and policies and identifying local businesses. We, we help support efforts to build capacity of suppliers directly and engage in programs like training the trainers to ensure sustainability. And in Guinea, Rio Tinto is leading a major program in this area, combining identification of potential suppliers, training and development of skills of those suppliers, and familiarizing banks with the kind of risks involved in supporting and helping those suppliers uh, develop. And as this map illustrates, our involvement in this area is very widespread, covering uh, the entire set of regions where we operate, including, of course, here in Africa. We can see from the collective experience uh, in working on supply chains and SMEs a number of challenges and lessons that have been learned, challenges from lack of clearly defined local content regulations, uh, lack of finance for SMEs to build up their operations to work with mining companies, lack of access to, to opportunities, issues with quality standards, and general shortages of, of personnel and skills. And we can see uh, uh, lessons learned, such as the need for government to intervene to create an enabling environment so local businesses can, in fact, take advantages of these opportunities created by uh, mining developments. We also see needs for greater definition of local procurement and general formalization of procurement into operations. Another aspect of economic development with which most of you are familiar with is local community development. In the last decade, the mining industry has made enormous progress in terms of managing environmental and social risks. Expectations, however, from local communities on how they should share in the economic impact from mining have increased over the past decade as well. And managing community relations remains challenging in many places, especially in changing political environments. Mining companies, of course, need to be strategic about and engage in their community investments. In Africa, communities are likely to become more demanding with increased resource development. Communities will challenge the industry, as they have been doing, to deliver greater benefits and compensate them in ways that they perceive as fair. And also water will be an emerging area of potential contention around mining developments. IFC partners with investors to broaden their development impact, offering advice and working both with companies and with local communities and governments on a range of initiatives, including revenue management, strategic community investment, and building local supply chains. But if jobs and community issues key parts of mitigating political risk through economic development are well known, albeit still challenging, a new area is emerging as at times an even more important element of political risk. And this is infrastructure. I noted at the outset rising opportunities as a key theme. These opportunities increasingly combine large scale, an extremely positive aspect, with locations in fragile jurisdictions and requiring very large infrastructure investments, generally of a greenfield nature, in countries which themselves have very weak infrastructure bases. The technical, but also political, risks coming out of this are enormous. And they're different than what most of us have seen before. The table on the screen shows some estimates only related to iron ore that I hope will get your attention. As far as we know at the IFC, outside of South Africa, only one private in infrastructure project in Africa has had capital costs and raised funding for them in excess of $1 billion. We believe that extraction of iron ore alone 
leave aside coal or any other minerals, could produce more than 10 such projects just looking at the infrastructure related to prospective mining developments. And because of costs and of the low likelihood that the governments involved will be able to succeed in financing and building that infrastructure, we think these are going to be left to the private sector. And these should be pretty sobering numbers. And they do not include electricity generation costs, water transmission costs, or other infrastructure aspects. And there are clearly major challenges to putting such infrastructure in place, from a limited number of financial solutions available for putting in place greenfield infrastructure, in particular greenfield multi-use infrastructure, bankability of the infrastructure assets as distinct from the mineral assets, very different issues relating to project finance structures, and, of course, where a lot of these resources lie, difficult and often changing political economy challenges. The core of the challenge, I would suggest, is how to use this infrastructure challenge as an opportunity for mitigating political risk. Africa's infrastructure de deficit is both a potential bottleneck for mining development and a development challenge. There is increasingly an overlay between the geography of mining deposits and where there is lack of available transport, power, and water. Multi-use and multi-client infrastructure can be an opportunity for mining to enhance its development impact on countries and regions for the long term as they serve as critical anchors for road, rail, port, water, power, and even telecommunications investments. Clearly, we are not speaking here of either of two traditional models. We are not speaking of publicly held and funded infrastructure, and we are not speaking of privately built and funded and proprietary vertically integrated single-user infrastructure. We are talking of something new, large-scale, multi-user infrastructure largely funded by the private sector. Now, this is something that we have started to focus fairly extensively on in the IFC. And the general picture, while this specific picture is quite daunting, I should note that this is in a context of an improving picture on infrastructure in Africa generally. We have seen, again, in our investments at IFC, picture changing quite radically in the last couple of years from a region where we could find opportunities to invest at best two to three hundred million dollars a year in supporting privately funded, privately run infrastructure. In the first six months of our current fiscal year, IFC has already invested over one billion dollars in power and transportation projects in the region. But in this broader positive context, the multi-user infrastructure, large-scale infrastructure that increasingly is going to become important for, for mining developments is a particular challenge. One possible model, which some of you may have seen in the workshop that we participated in two days ago, is around greenfield shared use public-private partnerships relying on an anchor mine. Those of you who saw Alan Davies speak yesterday here about Rio Tinto's multi-use transport investment plans in Guinea heard one of the earliest examples. As Alan noted, the economic effects around such multi-use infrastructure can be enormous, perhaps stimulating as much GDP growth as the infrastructure itself. Many of you involved in Mozambique are having similar conversations today. A similar approach to this transport can also be thought of in power generation through, through over-dimensioning power generation facilities for the use of mining developments that can then uh, be used to connect either to local communities, for, to uh, provincial grids, or to the national grid. These types of infrastructure investments will create many winners around a mining investment, not just the government, which benefits fiscally, and not just the community near the resource, but geographically dispersed actors in many sectors will also benefit. 
Those winners will want to see the mine succeed and will want to see the mine's activities continue. And that, we believe, is one of the most effective forms of political risk mitigation that we know. All of us will leave Cape Town and return to pursuing the opportunities which rising Africa is presenting us. In doing so, we will continue to work at the related challenges, including dealing with evolving political risks. We believe that a focus on economic development in its many forms is the best strategy to mitigate that risk. Mining companies are today better equipped to manage environmental and social risks. They are making huge strides on managing the parts of political risk, the parts of economic development that can mitigate political risk that we have been familiar with. We believe, as I have noted, that new approaches, and in particular for the large-scale uh, developments that we see as part of the future of the continent, infrastructure is going to become an increasingly important part of the challenge of the economic development aspects around the mines and as part of political risk mitigation to the investments around it. IFC hopes to be working with you to be part of the solution. We are committed to working with companies and governments on structures, financing packages, on advisory work that can bring longer-term benefits to a wide range of stakeholders. I started with thanks, and I will end with thanks, this time to our clients in mining in Africa here, who have given us the opportunities to support them and to learn alongside them. To all of you, thank you very much, and we look forward to continue working with you. have a few minutes. Are there any questions from the audience? Maybe I can kick off with one then, Bernie. You, you mentioned the, the PPP initiatives on infrastructure. Um, of course, a lot of, in, in my sector, the gold sector, we've seen a lot of companies in exploration and development struggling to find uh, cash and funding to build projects. Uh, is the IFC getting closely, more closely involved in that type of funding and, and assistance? Absolutely. Uh, IFC, I think, uh, has both uh, experience and certain advantages in looking at uh, PPP-type structures, uh, beginning with the fact that IFC itself is a public-private partnership. And that, of course, gives us a, a particular window into the issues. And a lot of our infrastructure investments uh, are either formally or informally public-private partnerships. The billion dollars that we've invested in the last six months in infrastructure in Africa are largely in public-private partnerships across a wide range of, of sectors. So that's something we have a tremendous appetite for and where we can really see an extremely close link between the value that can be created for shareholders, the risk mitigation, uh, elements of risk mitigation, in particular political risk mitigation, as I've underlined here, and uh, economic development. So this is an area that uh, we would love to have uh, opportunities to work, work uh, on uh, with, uh, with clients and for which we have uh, plenty of capital. Okay. So are there any questions from the audience? Doesn't look like it. Okay, Bernie, thank you very much for your presentation. All right, thanks.